Okay, in this session, we're going to do a little overview of the tools that we're using. Um, obviously, right now, because of the production on that, I'm using power tools. Uh, I'll allude to the uh, hand tools that people would have used years ago if they were just producing a pair infrequently for themselves or maybe a family member. But right now, I'm at the bandsaw. It's a 14-inch king. Uh, the Why I've gone with the 14-inch king is it has a two pulley system which is more direct it has a, a single horsepower the key ingredient to cutting good snowshoe wood is actually the blades purchased this particular blade is called a resaw blade it's for green wood and what it does is it has a, a little bigger set in the teeth it's only three teeth per inch so it has good clearance in the raw lumber and the birch in itself at this time of year when it thaws, it still has a significant amount of liquid in it, so it almost lubricates itself like a, a small bandsaw mill would do with the, the water reservoirs. Now, with the birch, uh, because it doesn't always split straight, we can't use a regular rail for, to cut square, perfectly good wood. What we have to use is this little tool here. Basically, it's, it's an uh, uh, amendment to the uh, rail. And what it enables is when it's installed, we'll just get this on here. Now with this installed, what it permits is it still permits you being able to cut accurate dimensions for your lumber or your boards for your snowshoes, but because the strips are crooked and sometimes twisted, it will enable you to follow this edge so that the wood is only in contact with one point and you always maintain the same dimension between that. So if you were cutting a long crooked stem and you wanted uh, a one inch wood, we'd set this up to one inch. And regardless of whether you have a twist or a bend in the wood, this would keep it there so that you have a good distance on it. Now the other thing with this is the generation of dust is ridiculously big with the, the birch, especially after you get them down to slat sizes. So I would strongly suggest that you get a shop vac and have a hose connection just to keep it away from you and help clean up the mess. Now we're going to go from the bandsaw over to the belt sander. The belt sander is a must when you're truing up the edges of your seasoned wood because you want to have it smooth. For instance, in the gluing session, you want them good and smooth. Now, this can only do the outside edges of the wood because the inside radius, you can't turn it around here. Now, using this one, this particular one is a 4x36, we'd usually go through multiple belts of a combination of 60, 80, and 120 grit. The 60 I would probably take off coarse sections where you get splintering in the end of the snowshoes. The 80 I'm going to kind of rough them down to their finished dimensioning. And then the 120 gives me that smooth finish so that I can work them, put the beams in, and then I'll give them a polish up, but not with the belt because the belt will leave streaking in the wood. After we've done the belt sanding, I go to a palm sander. Again, with various discs. Usually, I'm only running 120 to 220s to do a finished polish on the wood. Now, these are hook and release. Um, the, again, the option of dust, this is going to generate a lot of dust. And what I have is I have an old shop vac connected in. Uh, I don't have a bank system, so I have to interchange the hoses. So, if I'm using this, the hose goes in. If I'm using this one, I use the longer hose. The one thing with the, the palm sander is you don't generate as much dust as you would here. So you can either use this connection to your shop vac, or you can use the uh, self-containing dust collect bag that goes with the unit. Either one would be good. Now for the purposes of not the frames of the snowshoes, but for the cross beams, 
we have a 12 inch planer. Uh, if you had to make your beams by hand, they're going to be inconsistent in dimensioning and finish, especially because that has to be seasoned hardwood. Uh, whether you're using the birch, it's local cut, or the juniper, or oak that you might have as a, a waste from somebody's construction project. They're all good for the beams, but the older the wood is, the harder it is to do anything with. Because the frames themselves are easy to work, it's simply because the wood is still green and the birch as it ages gets harder and harder and harder so you don't want to be messing with your cross beams by hand uh, if you're doing eight or ten pairs if you're doing one or two cross beams then so be it this thing is uh, has very good accuracy does a good finish and we could probably run a hundred beams through that in maybe 15 minutes now the only other power tool that I use is my good old cordless drill. Um, this is used for the nailing holes and also for the salvage core holes that go around the end of the snowshoes uh, when we're getting to do the finishes on them. Uh, right now I'm just running with two bit sizes. When I nail I have a bit size that's just under the cross-section diameter of the nail so they're snug, they're not loose going in. And for the holes in the uh, end of the snowshoes, I use, I think it's a 564th, yeah, 564th bit. And that is just, just over the cross-section dimension of my number 15 uh, braided nylon twine that I use for the salvage cords. Now, when it comes to the accessory tools that we need, you usually need lots of C-clamps. Four, three, and two inches what I usually run. And to do one set of frames, if the wood is a little bit soft and uh, doesn't want to work well with you, you probably need about eight to ten clamps per snowshoe frame. So if you're structuring up for one or two pairs, you judge yourself accordingly. Now with the clamps, as we alluded to earlier, you have to use blocking. These are just Various blocks cut out of waste wood. Uh, these are oak. The area of the wood has to be as wide as two of your frames in the mold. The big solid oak ones I have here, and again, they were from just waste wood. You can see the varnish on the product. These are for usually, I use them on the top and the bottom when we're initially installing the beams because that's where we have, uh, the wood is hot, it's very soft, and if we use a small clamp, it'll mark the wood. So the bigger clamp in those areas, and again, these are made just from old plywood, but again, they have enough area to pick up two of these beams if they're clamped into a mold. Uh, for the beams, the actual beam installations, right now we're running with four wood chisels, this one inch is the one I usually use when I'm mortising out in this particular case this big frame so this is rough nailed it's not sanded but when I establish the point that the beam is going to go in I might have to saw a little bit off I'll do a little bit of cut here with a hack saw or a back saw and then very carefully use this to remove the the waste wood where I have a little mark in here to change the sizing out to fit those beams. These three are all quarter inch. The longer one I can use where I have lots of clearance inside the frame to do the mortising for the beams. Um, you'll find quickly the smaller your snowshoes go the shorter your chisel has to be simply because there's no room to maneuver the tool in to remove the waste wood once you have the mortise cut with the carpet knife. And this one again is just a little bit shorter. Uh, one of this size you're probably going to find that you just have to push it in. And the key to all of these, all three of these chisels, is the file and the stone. 
they have to be really, really, really sharp. Um, when you do file or grind your chisels, make sure you stone them with oil or water to make sure that there's no wire edge left on the back. Or what you're going to probably be doing is excess of effort and probably damage to the wood that you've waited two weeks to season to try and make a pair of snowshoes. The good old reliable carpet knife, uh, that's what I usually use to cut the mortise lines that I've traced over from the beams. Um, there's lots of them on the market. There's the collapsible ones, fold-up ones. The problem with these is they're, they're, they're quite a bit longer and there's a lot more blade exposed. And they have a tendency to, you have a tendency to break them a lot because you're pulling through that wood at about an eighth of an inch at a time to cut those mortises out. This particular one is nice and short, very compact, and it holds the blade in a little bit further so you don't have so much exposed and you reduce the breakage. And this good old tool, this is the one that we've used to ensure that we have some consistencies with the drilling operation that we do when we do the toes and tails of the snowshoes. Once we find the center of the snowshoe, and are going to go left and or right to mark in our holes, we'll just play with this till we get it equidistant till it reaches the bottom part of that toe or tail where the cross beam intersects. And that's just for consistency in your, in your drilling. And the drilling of these and the equidistant spacing of the strings makes a better look in your snowshoe when you're tying in so many loops into your salvage cords. Now, here we have a, a, a beam that was ready for one part of a frame on the snowshoe. And what I want to talk about is some of the older tools that were used uh, years ago. First, uh, somebody might go out and get a birch tree and they'd split it by hand with an axe and then they split it down to a quarter and then they would split it again until they had some resemblance of a long slat that was going to be used to make a snowshoes for their own personal use. Now, after they get it chopped down to, I don't know, maybe one and one eighth or one and one quarter inches, they would then sit with the crooked knife, the draw knife, and what they would do is because this, now this one's a little bit seasoned, so it might not react as well, but what they would do is they would either wood for trueness, and if they needed to take a little off here or there, they just pull with the knife. Until I say, hey, I got enough off of that. And that's an inch now. So this one is still a little bit damp. And we'll change the grain. So what would they, they do in this is they just pull with this. For number one, the width of the board. There we go. And then they convert it over and then do the thickness. Now, that's very, very laborious work. That's why, <laughs> because we're in, in mass production here, uh, all of this particular part of it is primarily done on the bandsaw. It gets me to within 1 32nd of where I want, and then I would use the uh, belt sander to pull it up. Another tool that you can use if you can clamp your wood and it's not too too wet is a spoke shave. Again, it's just another draw knife. Same principle. Take off little bits at a time. You're not going to do a whole lot of damage to your wood. And these are available in a number of sizes. And the last one that we've used will be the block plane. Now, anything bigger than the block plane, a 10 or a 12 or a 16 inch, uh, would just be too big because of the undulations in the wood and a little bit of curvature. All we're gonna do here is we're gonna set this up, adjust this down, and take off little bits. And what I'm doing here is, all I'm doing is I'm getting rid of the saw marks on the wood. And as the saw marks disappear, we check the thickness, and here you can notice the context, the contour, the finish. It's a lot smoother. 
Now this would have to be done uh, before you steam the wood. And after you steam it and get it bent, this tool is not very good for the uh, bent steamed wood, and especially after it starts curing a little bit. The spoke shave will work well with the dry wood because you can do the inside corners, the outside corners. This one has limited use and probably is only used when they're making the long slats themselves. This segment we're going to do a little bit of discussion about the twines that I'm using. Um, not necessarily what they did in the past because in the past it was mostly hide. Uh, most of these are synthetics, nylons, or polys. This gold twine is a nylon braid and this is the one that we use for the salvage cord. Uh, why we use the braided is number one the strength uh, in conjunction with the smaller size and it has some significant wear resistance as opposed to a single stranded or a twisted string. They would just wouldn't survive. I've seen snowshoes and with this twine used last up to 15 or 16 years in all kinds of crazy weather conditions. So this would be a number 15 or a number 18 braided nylon and that would be the salvage cord for the initial run around where you install the tassels in the ends of the snowshoe. When it comes to the filling, uh, we've got all kinds of options with the polys from a 1.5 mil up to a 4 mil, various colors as you can see. What we normally go with in the ends is anything from a 1.5 to a 2.5. Uh, color combinations, customer selection. These come in two uh, styles in that one, these particular blue, orange, and green are a flat braided poly. They're, they're very nice to use in the snowshoes because the flat cross section of the twine gives you good displacement and that's what you're looking for in a snowshoe. You want something to keep you up on the snow. So the smaller the twine, the less displacement you have. So this is usually used in the middle and the smaller twines are used in the ends uh, depending on the size of the end, whether it's a big toe, a small toe, in that it'll still get some displacement but the big twines just won't function in that small end. Now, these other polys, different colors, these are a different style. They have a core. Now, the core makes this want to be oval or round. And oval and round is not good for, if I take that core and I just move that back a bit, if I pull this twine, I can see that it goes rather flat. That's better for the snowshoe. If you don't take it out, it still maintains a smaller diameter and it's, it's rounded. And it's rounded, it'll chafe. And the also, the, the thing with the roundness of it, it's very difficult to take out twists and tie your knots. So for these types, and you won't know until you buy them, if you find that you get the poly with the core, uh, cut significant lengths, like I will start with a 60 foot length, and then drop down uh, for the filling of the middles of the bigger snowshoes. I'll drop down to 30 foot lengths and then do the joins as we did in the filling. Same thing we did in the filling for the ends. That little twist in it, burn the ends, do the double loop and we joined up. But I would not suggest that you use any of the polys that have the core for your initial fills. Now with these again, I said there's, there's lots of color selections. Uh, the white the one thing that I found is you cannot get a white in the polys for the ends. A lot of people like the white with the reds for children or the white with pinks for ladies. And then again, the, the bigger mover that I have is the combination of the white in one end, the smaller green in another end, and the blue in the middle just to replicate the Labrador flight colors. The other available uh, filling twine or membrane is a synthetic sinew and basically this one is a straight strand sinew that's waxed. It, it does look nice in a snowshoe. It looks somewhat like 
a original fill with hide or caribou babish or moose babish. But the thing with the waxing is it, it gets very, very dirty, uh, tricky to keep flat, and if it gets a twist, it, it looks then just like a needle. So it doesn't give you displacement. Now, when you get a twist in this stuff, and that's why I allude to its difficulty, it's very hard to get it flat again. You might have to pinch it back three or four inches and try and remove that twist. And not very often does it come out, as you can see from here. The cross-section change of that little twist is. I only use this for special orders. Uh, it's significantly more expensive than these things. These things will probably cost you $12. This thing is going to cost you $50. And it's very awkward to use. I wouldn't recommend it for a beginner. Now, this other small, flat, woven nylon is actually aircraft lacing. Now, this is a black. Uh, it's not stranded like this. It's braided, so it doesn't twist together, there's no waxing on it, and it stays very, very flat. Use is very easy, uh, knots nicely, and you can join this the same as the way we did the join when we were filling the toes in the poly. Now this last one, again, this one was a waxed straight cord synthetic sinew. This was a black cable wrap braided nylon. This is a white cable wrap, braided, but it has a little bit of waxing on it. And the waxing, uh, in this particular case, is very, very good to stop any premature rots. Even though it is a nylon, you will get some rot in it. And this stuff is very, very strong. Uh, it holds its cross-section flat. If it does get a twist in it, the easy squeeze your thumb and it's flat again almost immediately. So, and there's lots of other twines out there, um, but the reason most people now have a tendency to go back to the polys is because with natural babish, moose hide, cow hide, other things available from craft producers, especially out Western Canada, the hide is nice to use if you want to have something that's authentic. The problem with the hide is, is you have to soak it in sections in water and you actually have to fill your snowshoes with this rawhide soaking wet. So it's very messy, difficult to take to the Noah sometimes. Then when you get so much of it done, that snowshoe has a dry so it shrinks and tightens up. And then in order to protect it from the elements, it has to be varnished. And that process, normally done in the factories and things, is they just have a big large vat. They dip the whole snowshoe down in it eight or ten times till it's coated when it's actually dried and that prevents it from getting wet because as soon as it gets wet it stretches at least a third of its length so instead of your nice flat tight snowshoe giving you a good displacement in the woods so you can walk it becomes a saggy bag under your feet and then it just it just doesn't function so not very many people would use the old babishes hides any longer we've gone to the poly simply because there's no stretch once they're done, there's no dry rot, and there's no absorption of water that changes its length. They just don't get slack. Very inexpensive, easily available at actually most fishing outlets. Uh, in Newfoundland, Clarenville is a good place. Uh, in St. John's area, uh, in Pippi Place, there's North Atlantic Specialties, have a full range of colors. They can go bigger. You can get this poly from a 1.5 up to a size 8 mil. 8 mil would be like using a quarter inch board. It's very big, very coarse, so that's a little too heavy. Right now I'm running up to from a 1.5 to 4s and I find that pretty satisfactory for all, even the larger snowshoes that I do.